Good afternoon. Welcome to this UNU Wider Research Webinar, part of our new series on how COVID-19 is changing development. My name is Rachel Giselquist. I'm a Senior Research Fellow here at UNU Wider, and I'm very pleased to be chairing the session this afternoon. I think that some of you in the audience are new to UNU Wider. We are the United Nations University World Institute for Development Economics Research. And we began operations here in Helsinki about 35 years ago as the first research center of the United Nations University, which is the academic arm of the UN system. We work on issues of international development, on issues affecting the living conditions of the world's poorest people. Today in our webinar, we'll be talking about issues of taxation and COVID-19, uh, with particular focus on Sub-Saharan Africa. In recent years, I think it's fair to say there's been a hopeful tone in discussions about public revenue in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, aid has moved a bit out of the spotlight, and a major question, one which a number of our colleagues and collaborators here at UNU Wider have been working on, um, is how African governments themselves might finance the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. So now with the COVID-19 pandemic, the situation is in flux. How will the economic costs of the pandemic be borne? What will the role be for domestic revenue mobilization in Sub-Saharan Africa? And how might tax administrations respond? I'm very, very pleased today to welcome our speaker, Professor Mick Moore, who will be speaking to these topics. The title of his presentation um, is Tax After the Pandemic, Can Africa Raise the Revenue It Needs? He is a professorial fellow at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex and the founding CEO and a senior fellow with the International Center for Tax and Development. He's a political economist with broad interests and a long list of publications on issues of governance and public administration in low-income countries and specific interests in taxation and development. And he has extensive field research experience, especially in Sri Lanka, Taiwan, and India. And he's done advisory work in many countries in Africa and in Asia. I'm also very pleased to welcome a second speaker today, Mili Isingoma, Nalukwago, who will be serving as our discussant this afternoon. She is the Assistant Commissioner for Research, Planning and Development at the Uganda Revenue Authority. And she has 25 years of experience in tax administration in Uganda. Among her number of roles and responsibilities and activities, I should also, I wanted to mention that she is collaborating with UNU Wider uh, um, in connection with our work on tax administrative data and the South Mod project, which is a, a joint project between UNU Wider, the European Union Tax Benefit Microsimulation Model, Euromod at the University of Essex, and the Southern African Social Policy Research Insights, SASPRI, in which uh, tax benefit microsimulation models for selected countries, selected developing countries are being built. She will be sharing insights on the preparations that the Uganda Revenue Authority is making to address the issue of taxation after the COVID-19 pandemic. So in a moment, I'll turn the microphone over to our speakers, but first just a brief note before we start on how the seminar will work today. As you might've noticed, uh, your microphones have been muted, but I would encourage you to think of questions that you can pose to our speakers. And I would encourage you um, during the presentations, if you would like to uh, send questions through the Q&A function. And after the presentations, I will be, we will be turning to, to the questions. Most likely I'll read the questions. If time permits, I might be able to unmute a few of you to allow you to ask, to ask your questions directly. Uh, without further ado then, let me turn the microphone over first to Mick. Good afternoon. Um, it is nice to, I can't say meet so many of you online, let's say connect with you online like this. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel, for the introduction and thank you, Wider, for organizing this seminar on the topic that is closer to my heart than almost any other topic in the world. So I am delighted to be talking here. Delighted, but also slightly flummoxed because as I think it will be 
evident to most people. We are talking about a future scenario which is extremely uncertain and it's likely to be extremely variable from one part of sub-Saharan Africa to another. We don't yet know uh, what will be the economic of impact of COVID, whether it will go away and come back and there'll be further impact, how long it will take to recover. We can be fairly sure that there's going to be a lot of variation from one country to another. But I'm going to argue, and I want to talk about this at the end, that it would not be the right moment for governments and ministries of finance to say, well, okay, we'll just wait and see what happens and then think of our tax response to this. Because I think it's very important to be thinking of the tax response now. And I will explain that later. But before we uh, start talking about the substance, I have a question for you. It's an online poll here. And you have a choice of four answers to the question. The question is, how important is it to start taxing the informal sector? And your potential answers are A, very important, B, moderately important, C, not very important, and D, I don't know what that would actually mean in practice. So let me give you 10 seconds or so, uh, silence, to think about that and to vote, and uh, then we will move on. I've got lots of votes coming up very fast now. Okay, um, well, there might be a few more votes, but uh, let us move on at this moment. Okay, I'm just gonna start with a simple statistic. Um, Government revenue as a percent of GDP, the standard measure of how much revenue governments raise. Uh, as you will see, and you shouldn't be surprised, Africa is fairly near the bottom of the list in terms of regions on average, with of course an enormous variation within Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in fact, slightly higher than South Asia. Now, whether this is a good figure or a bad figure is actually a very open question. Uh, some people will look at that and say, look, that's only half of the figure for Europe and Central Asia. We need to raise a lot of revenue. Um, but there are other reasons for saying, well, actually, that's not as bad as you might think. And you certainly shouldn't uh, drive yourself into a depression and say Sub-Saharan Africa can't raise tax revenue. Because in some respects, Sub-Saharan Africa is not bad at raising tax revenue, and tax revenue has been increasing in recent years. But also, tax administration in Sub-Saharan Africa is, I wouldn't say it's very good. I would certainly say it's much better than some people believe. Uh, we still have parts of the world where people think that Africa has peculiar and special problems with uh, establishing and managing uh, modern government institutions. And they're rather surprised when they see how well Africa does in terms of raising taxes. And if we look at the quality of tax administration, which we can't measure by any single figure, but we can measure by quite a few different figures, um, Sub-Saharan Africa doesn't score badly. I just put in this graph some figures uh, that ultimately derive from the World Bank Enterprise Surveys, which is the proportion of uh, occasions where the tax collector comes along to a company and the company reports this is typically associated with a request for a bribe. Um, as you'll see, the figure for Sub-Saharan Africa, it's nearly 20%, which is not good. Uh, but the figure for some other parts of the world is actually appreciably higher. So Sub-Saharan Africa does not score at all badly on that. And there are in fact a range of uh, other measures of the uh, quality of tax administration that I'm just going to summarize here. And they are all summarized in the book, which you will see on the screen, which is still fairly up to date. 
In terms of tax effort, which is a statistical measure of uh, how much taxes are raised relative to expected taxes, Sub-Saharan Africa does fairly well. In terms of the proportion of direct taxes, Sub-Saharan Africa does fairly well. We're often told that low-income countries depend heavily on indirect taxes. Broadly true, but Sub-Saharan Africa actually does better than many. If we look at the uh, measures of tax administration that come every year from the World Bank in paying taxes, well, the amount of staff time taken by the typical company in uh, the average country of sub-Saharan Africa to comply with all the tax process is in fact, again, not high by global standards and is considerably lower than some other regions of the world. And from a similar survey, something called the post-filing index, which is basically the time taken by the revenue administration to correct a problem that uh, has been identified in the accounts the company files. Again, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, is relatively efficient. So we don't... Hmm, interesting. Sorry, I'm having a problem moving my screen here. <laughs> um, I beg your pardon, folks, for some reason. Oh, maybe it's here. OK, sorry. <laughs> yeah, start. so the tax administration is not bad and a major reason for that is that a lot of tax reforms have been implemented in sub-Saharan Africa over the last 20 to 30 years. And these are very complex. Um, it's very hard to begin to summarize them, but we can make, give you a few examples. Compared to 20 or 30 years ago, the typical taxpayer in sub-Saharan Africa is less likely to need to have a physical face-to-face -face meeting and to make the actual tax payments with the tax man. And that's a very good thing because this is classically the site of corruption and collusion. Even better, possibly, the taxpayer is less likely to have to go and meet one tax man in order to uh, pay her income tax and another tax man to go and pay a sales tax or VAT, and another tax man to pay excise, etc. So that's all very positive. Further, the tax man is much more likely to be a woman than 20 or 30 years ago. And there are various good reasons, and Millie can talk about those if um, we get the chance later, uh, why we think that is actually a good thing, uh, not just for society in general, but actually for tax collection. And further, our tax woman or tax man is much more likely than 20 or 30 years ago to have a professional qualification and a specialist re role related to that qualification in something like IT or accounting or taxpayer services or taxpayer education, human resources, internal vigilance, research or law. In other words, tax administrations are much more sophisticated organizations than they were 20 or 30 years ago. But, and I should add in addition that virtually every country in sub-Saharan Africa has adopted VAT and VAT is now the largest single source of government revenue for sub-Saharan Africa. Despite all that, Actually, we are not moving forward very fast at all in terms of government revenue as a percentage of GDP. Uh, there's a whole range of reasons why we can't give you a very clear answer and they're disputed. A lot of it's to do with revenues from natural resources that vary uh, very much from year to year and depend on natural resource prices in world markets. But we can say pretty conclusively that on average in Africa, the ratio of government revenue to GDP is somewhere being completely stationary 
and increasing very slightly. So certainly tax revenues have been going up, but that reflects the fact that GDP has been going up. So we're not actually making major progress. And even before COVID, uh, people were pointing out that those expectations that governments in sub-Saharan Africa would be able to fund to a significant degree the achievement um, of the sustainable development goals were just not, we were not on the way to meeting those expectations. So why? Well, there are various ways of approaching the why question, but however you do it, you're gonna to get to the politics of it eventually. So let's start with the politics of it. And uh, especially since Millie is here, let's start with Uganda. Uh, this is a piece of research done by Millie's colleagues two or three years ago that uh, looked at the taxation, or we could almost say non-taxation of what are technically rich people, high net worth individuals in Uganda. And I'm just giving you a couple of illustrative figures here. Um, there are many more in the paper itself, but the paper, the figures are quite striking. In the year 2013 to 2014, the researchers identified 71 government officials who they believe from various sources to be rich. Only one of those 71 people paid any personal income tax in that year. There were 56 companies associated with those individuals and only 17 of those companies paid any corporate income tax in that year. Uh, it's not just Uganda, uh, we don't have a great deal of research on these issues, but uh, very similar research has just been done in Rwanda, again, by the Rwanda uh, Revenue Authority staff themselves. And here is a very similar figure. 2018, they identified 42 people who were probably high net worth individuals on their definition. Of those 42, only eight ever filed um, any kind of personal income tax return in that year, which uh, doesn't tell you how much tax they pay, but it's not a very good sign. And in fact, the um, other bit of the slide shows if you look at the income tax law, there are, as you find in, in many tax laws, there is a kind of odd wording of the requirement to file an income tax return that allows many rich people to say, well, um, you are taking income tax from my salary and the money I get from my investments is already being withheld. I don't need to fill in a return. Uh, we can again go into that later if we wish. And there are plenty of other cases of under taxation in Africa that are effectively in some degree or other the result of political decisions and governments not wanting either not wanting to do things or succumbing to pressure to do the wrong thing. Um, these have been summarized in a ICTD working paper of three years ago but the major ones are wealth and property are grossly undertaxed. It's very striking that an increasing number of African cities, property values are extremely high. Some people have an awful lot of money invested in property, but they pay virtually no tax on it. Mining has tended to be very much undertaxed. Uh, alcohol and tobacco, um, very much undertaxed. Tobacco, a particular problem because consumption is growing fast and it's a bad thing to do for health reasons. The exemptions that are granted unnecessarily to investors are um, almost everyone who's researched this says they are simply too large and they are a very significant fraction of potent potential tax revenue in many countries this is not a marginal issue it's a very big issue and again VAT exemptions. As I said earlier, Africa has almost universally adopted VAT. VAT is in fact the biggest single source of income, but it is full of holes of various kinds and could actually generate much more revenue if government didn't give so many exemptions. 
And in discussing these issues, I'm not talking at all about the challenges of taxing transnational uh, companies and of digital economic transactions across borders, which is a very big and a very ongoing subject, but I don't have time to get at that here. Partly because this is something that's not immediately uh, within the reach of any individual African government. There's limited amount they can do about this. But, so there are political explanations, but um, politics doesn't explain everything. And the other, one other way of looking at is looking at the efficiency of organizations. Um, and, um, you know, how good actually are uh, revenue authorities and other tax collectors in Africa? Well, we don't have a very clear answer to this, but I think that there are two quite important identifiable problems. And one is that information technology that's now to some degree used in virtually all tax national tax collection organizations in Africa is very much underused for in all kinds of ways and for all kinds of reasons and simply does not generate the benefits it should benefit, so it should bring. Now that is on the one hand, that's bad news. On the other hand, that's actually quite good news uh, because this, this is something that is relatively fixable in a short period of time. The other issue I wish to discuss, but um, do we have the results of the, of the poll here before I go into this? I, um, I removed it from my screen. Here we are. Okay. Very important, moderately important, not very important. I don't know what it would mean in practice. Yeah, I'm afraid this is bad news. Um, this is kind of what I expected. Um, that the majority of you, two thirds of you, think this is at least a significant problem. Um, I'm going to be for Brock. I think you're wrong. I just think you're wrong. Um, and I'm going to say something even more um, confrontational about it in a minute. You're not wrong if you are referring to wealthy people who are engaging in all kinds of economic activities and transactions that they're somehow, uh, for example, uh, doing in cash and avoiding banks and therefore avoiding taxes. But if you mean by the informal sector, small operators, people selling things on streets, people doing little bits of metal bashing in their backyard and all those informal things that are done. I do not think there is a significant problem. I don't think they should be paying tax most of the time. And I'm gonna be even more provocative by saying, I think there is an obsession in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa with registering a large number of new taxpayers called the informal sector that is almost entirely unproductive. Um, again, the Uganda will come in here and Millie knows this story very well. The Uganda Revenue Authority enormously increased the number of people that were registered for taxation over a short period of time. Um, ended up with a very large taxpayer register that was extremely inaccurate um, useless for many purposes, not usable in terms of actually collecting taxes. Most people continued not to file, or if they filed, um, they just filed a nil return saying uh, not, no economic activity or not enough to justify paying taxes. And in various ways, that is a story we see across much of sub-Saharan Africa, an obsession with registration, registration. Um, I don't think small operators should be paying tax anyway, and certainly not to national governments. They might need to pay them to local governments. And I'm going to be particularly provocative here because I think this obsession with registering large numbers of small taxpayers is probably playing a rather malign um, role in politics. I think it's actually distracting attention from the big problem. And the big problem was those slides I showed you a little while ago. Let's go back to those slides. That's it's that distracting attention from that problem. Uh, so I would be really happy if uh, next time that poll is done, 
many poor people say this is not a problem or if it is a pro it's certainly not a significant problem or I'm not even sure what we mean by this. So um, where are we now? Uh, this is my summary of what I think the current situation is, although I'm looking forward to, Millie will tell us a little bit more, and we only have, I think, fragments, or I only have fragments of information about what's happened for, uh, to revenues and revenue collection since COVID struck. We're pretty sure revenues are falling, there's less economic activity, governments have often uh, formally deferred collection, but there are all kinds of very practical collection challenges anyway. It's likely, I have no direct evidence for this, but one or two suggestions that the more digitized, effectively digitized revenue administrations are coping better, principally because they are dependent less on any two ind individuals meeting face to face, whether in the office or in a business or somewhere else, and things can go on nearer normal. Thirdly, it's highly likely that subnational governments will be particularly badly hit in this case because their revenue collection is almost entirely done on the basis of face-to-face -face and written records, uh, very few digital records. It'll be very difficult for them to raise revenues in these, circ in these circumstances. And fourthly, I think we are in a position where governments will be thinking about the need to raise more revenues in, I don't know when, a few months, a year, two years. It's going to vary from country to country. Now, this is potentially a very worrying situation. And it's not just about tax, it's about politics and governance uh, and trust in government more broadly. There are a range of threats here, and here this summarizes four of them. One is that governments might find it really difficult to even get revenues back up to where they were because people are poor and they feel that they have not been well treated in relation to COVID and they're just not going to pay. Secondly, in related, there's a real risk that the governments and tax collectors will go in rather heavily. They'll have targets and they will just achieve their targets, whatever. And that is going to involve a lot of unfairness and some people paying just because they get caught. And that could worsen the political conflict. And third, taxation could become extremely con contentious. And fourthly, quite likely that informal taxes of various kinds on poor people, which are often quite high, might increase. So I want to conclude on a slightly more optimistic note and saying, but I think this is also a time of some opportunity. And that's why I hope governments and ministries of finance and revenue authorities will be thinking about these issues now, even if there's not much they can do this month or next month. Um, this is a sort of a bit of an idealistic manifesto and it's uh, not supposed to be one size fits all, but there are basically three principles here. And the first principle says that it would be very important to avoid putting additional tax burdens on the poorest 50% or even the poorest 80% of households because they have probably suffered more than anyone else so far from COVID. Um, both in terms of the disease itself and the economic impact, and it would be really unfair uh, to put more burden on them. Second one says you should also avoid to the extent possible putting revenues, uh, revenue burdens in such a way that they're going to impede business because business needs to recover. But, and there's a big but, there's an awful lot of wealth and high income and capital gains and many other things that could and should be taxed and this is where the you know the burden should fall and thirdly one would hope that governments would be able not just to make changes in tax revenue but to tell an extremely good and convincing story each fitted to their own situation about why they are changing the tax system, why it is fair to change the burden of taxation from poorer people to richer people, and hopefully 
um, to say that at the same time they're going to take advantage of tax changes to try and address some bigger societal problems, including air pollution, environment, climate change, etc., which are certainly not as possibly as immediately urgent in many much of Africa as they are elsewhere in the world, but are very fast becoming very urgent in Africa. So on that um, optimistic note, I will uh, stop and I will hand you over to Millie who will uh, tell me why I'm being far too um, optimistic, right, Millie? <laughs> Wonderful, thank you, Millie. Thank you. Can you all see my screen? Yes, I see it here. Okay. Okay, good afternoon to you all. Uh, thank you Nwaida for the opportunity that you've given um, us to share this, the opportunity you've given Uganda and the work we've done together. Thank you, Mick, for that great, very provocative <laughs> presentation that you've given. I'd like to speak to, speak to this presentation and I'll, I'll, I'll share as I speak to uh, what Mick has, has shared. I have a slide there showing uh, what Uganda Revenue Authority is our mandate, of course, is to collect tax and uh, our mission is to provide an environment that is a delightful experience for revenue um, services and business facilitation. And this speaks to what um, Mick has been sharing, that we should move um, away from just um, increasing the numbers, but plan and do proper uh, revenue administration as, as we go ahead. And on my slide there, you can see, though Mick shared that uh, the tax to GDP in Sub-Saharan Africa is 19%. Uh, for Uganda, our target for next financial year is uh, about 14.5% of GDP. Uh, last financial year, we had about 15%, uh, but when we rebased our GDP, we went back to 129 So there's that. That, that constant struggle to move up and it speaks to a lot of, um, of what Mick has been sharing. So before I go to, to the impact of COVID, I'd like to talk briefly about um, some of the things that, uh, that Mick has raised. Of course, we've carried out these studies with, uh, with the team and rightfully so when you look at uh, the contribution of uh, of our indirect taxes to, to revenues, if I consider both the locally generated and the ones that I are from imported products, we are a little above 40% of, of, of the total revenues that we collect. So true indirect taxes and VAT uh, for Uganda is similar to what um, Mick has observed. And uh, you find that um, from that study, and as I'll share, the study we carried out, we are now having more focus on the high net worth individuals. We actually created a unit that uh, goes out to look out for these high net worth individuals. And, and now more than ever, as I'll share later, we are also getting into the property area, the rental income tax, and who are these individuals that are owning property that we need to mobilize revenues from. Uh, when we come to some of these, um, the political decisions uh, not to tax. Uh, you find that, uh, like I've said, when we look at the high net worth individuals who are having properties, we have done uh, quite some analysis uh, informed by some of those studies and the information that we are having. And you find that a number of them, yes, are hiding behind reinvesting the revenues rather than, than pay, um, putting a lot of interest, loan, loan interest from loans, and some of the loans are for, from intercompanies. They are having a number of branches of companies that they, the, the, the directors create a number of many other companies and the revenues 
uh, siphoned out through that. So all that analysis is now uh, going on and we hope that uh, we'll be able to address a number of these areas. When we get to the point of why, why is IT information technology underused? Uh, some of the observations we've, we've come to is, one of them is about the skill about the skill and uh, it's very important that as the sub-Saharan African or, or developing countries uh, bring on board the data warehouses and, and uh, other tools to bring information together, they must not forget skilling the staff because there's one thing having information but there's another being able to use it. So with, with the staff that we are having now who are doing more of this analysis, they are able to do um, an echo mapping analysis where you're able to bring all these different submissions, the VAT, the corporation tax and all those, in order to be able to assess and identify who are the high net worth and where is the revenue coming from. So one of the issues that are coming through uh, is the skills, uh, maybe the fear of information when we talk about data scientists and what a number of, the, of of tax collectors, uh, 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 mathematicians, or probably, you know, when you talk of science, some people um, get lost. And also focus, it's very, very important that the leadership, the leadership is focused towards use of data analysis to inform, to inform uh, revenue administration. And um, again, when he says the obsession of registering large numbers, indeed, and I'll say that, uh, yes, we have a register of about 1,500, uh, 1, 1, 1, 1,500,000 taxpayers. But near to half of that uh, taxpayers whom we consider to be small and medium, whose turnover is less than uh, 2 million dollars, 2 million US dollars a year. So you find that yes our register has all these who are small and how do we uh, expand this and this i think has also apart from the political reasons nick has provided there's also the focus when you focus on numbers because the key performance indicator that you've given staff is how many are you bringing on to the register you get it wrong and that you are a we have changed the focus now we are looking at value how many value or how much value are you bringing on board? And that again takes us towards doing more of analysis so that by the time you go out to register, you know, you know. And when you have these data warehouses where information comes in or data lakes and all that, then you're able to identify who are the people out there, including working with other government bodies. And I think that's one thing Mick did not bring out one of the areas we are grappling with as developing economies or Uganda in particular is how do we link with other agencies? There's one thing about information being standard across the board. So that if this is Mili in URA, you'll find her the same Mili in immigration, the same Mili across all data sets. So you're able to bring in this information and be able to. So that is an area that we are also uh, still working on really to be able to um, to get to to tax the right people. So I'll now move very quickly through these slides uh, from what uh, Mick has shared and from what has been out there. We are facing the same, the same challenges. We projected our economy to go at six. Right now we are 3.1%. We have both the formal and informal um, part of our economy affected. For the formal, it's obvious, hotel tourism. For the informal, we have those small people that Mick has uh, talked about, the, the, the ones on the street, the vendors, and, and, and all those who are going through this. And how has it impacted us as, as a revenue mobilizing agency? Uh, we have to, to quickly move into staff working from home, change of culture, anxiety, we have anxiety of the staff who are working from home and the ones at the border stations. And for our clients, of course, lockdown is affecting them to be able to file and pay on time. 
and some of them are having to change their businesses very quickly. Those who are producing alcohol are moving into sanitizers and, and things like that. So it is a whole new experience for all of us and, and our clients. Of course, revenues have declined, like Mick mentioned, and without going into a lot of details, uh, they declined so much in Apple, and we are thinking maybe Apple was our climax, but still, like Mick shared, we don't know, will it come back, will it go, will it? So, so we are just, we keep hoping that the situation will, will really improve. But you can see, we can see that in May, um, though generally the revenues declined compared to last year, we are still seeing hope in some of our uh, of our sectors that are showing some improvements where we had imports decline so much especially like from uh, our highest uh, countries like china kenya tanzania we are seeing them pick up in may we don't know what will come through in june but we are still uh, quite hopeful and you find that um uh, there are a number of things that we are doing of course for staff we've put policies in place masks and all that i want to speak a little more on revenue on the area of revenue we are encouraging our clients and taxpayers to do tax health checks and as they are doing that we are doing a lot of data analysis internally and it speaks back again to what Mick has shared what are the revenue administrations or governments doing to prepare for the post you can't sit now and wait until it has ended. So through this data analysis, we are discovering a lot of um, potential revenues, and we believe that uh, it will support us not to focus on, on the small um, taxpayers. Um, another thing we're doing is we are providing installment payments uh, for them, the tax reliefs for raw materials. All this has been uh, done by so many other countries across the world. So I'll speak to the area of the electronic commerce and digital economy, and as well as real estate. Why have we focused on digital economy? Because everyone is going E. Everything is going digital, and we believe that that is where we should follow the money now. So as we are doing analysis, we are also putting together strategies on where shall we find the tax point? Is it at the cuts when people put in? Is it at the point of paying? So we are coming up with those strategies. So as we are doing the strategy for, for the digital, we are also coming up with a strategy, though I've not mentioned it here, for the small, for the small people. What relief are we giving them? What analysis are we doing? Because we know that how some of our clients hide within the small ones. So we are doing an analysis to establish who are the small and should remain the small. And then who are those? And it speaks to, to mix poll. The poll he sent out and said, informal sector. We need to clearly define who is in the informal sector. And for us, who is small, who is big, but is hiding in the informal sector so that we get you out of there and support you to be able to mobilize revenue in order not to get it wrong. Uh, like Mick has shared that if we, we don't have a strategy, we will just uh, tax whatever is available and will not able, be able to get it wrong. So my last slide here is just to demonstrate um, our moving towards the, the online services. We've automated uh, a number of interventions that uh, our, our interventions with the with the taxpayers so we have interventions in the domestic taxes the customs and online payments and we've uh, en enhanced this and we believe this is the new normal and like mick said that as, as as revenue administrations modernize there'll be more of online than the, the, the than the face to face and uh, i believe uh, this will will fairly prepare us for what we expect to come in uh, post-COVID and also enable us to mobilize enough revenues for our respective uh, economies to be able to, to pick up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Mick and Millie. This has really um, been 
uh, thought-provoking set of presentations. And I can see in the Q&A box here that we have a number of questions um, for both of you. But before I turn over to the questions, Mick, would you like to um, respond uh, a bit to Millie's uh, presentation, to Millie's discussing comments? Um, yeah, thank you, Rachel. Now, let me pass on that because um, I was very pleased to hear many of the things Millie said, and we, we seem to, th to think rather alike, surprisingly. You would, you would imagine we'd met before, right, Millie? <laughs> <laughs> Which we have many times. <laughs> let's go to question, Rachel. Okay, then, let's kick off. Um, so I'll start with a question from Paolo Di Renzio. So the question relates to the opportunity slide in, in Mick's presentation. Um, it looks more, he says, like an optimistic agenda, or it look, yes, it looks more like an optimistic agenda. How can it become a realistic or a politically feasible one? Which reform coalitions in different African countries could provide sufficient pressure on governments to adopt these reforms? Can we get Millie to answer that one? <laughs> okay. Um, yes, this, this, uh, this slide looks optimistic. However, it's important that, um, that governments sit together. And I think the, the environment is right now is that all uh, government agencies and governments are now thinking what happens. Our, our economy is going to have a free fall until um, we are unable to support. Something has to be done. I'll, I'll share on, uh, like, like I said, we are coming up with the strategies to 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 ensure that the poor the poorest are not pressed but the ones who are in the sectors of the winners are able to support uh, the, the economy to grow and one of the areas i'll talk about uh, for uganda the agricultural sector which has forever um not been able to attract attention is attracting a lot of attention now and I believe we will be able to get in there and uh, be able to support the economy because it is, it is a do or die. You either support your economy grow or it dies off. So it, it must be done. And, and in life, you always have to be optimistic. You must be optimistic. Otherwise, you will not get the energy to move and be able to bring uh, your respective economies back. Yes. Can I just insert one a couple of senses on that? And I agree with Millie. Um, Paolo, I think my main immediate target for that, well, obviously it's partly civil society groups, but it's actually principally governments, because I think many governments in Africa, if they think ahead, will realize that they might have some very serious political problems. If they don't have enough revenue, they're trying to raise revenue in ways that upset a lot of people. And they, a lot of conflict breaks out over who is actually to pick up the bill for COVID. Um, then I think they could be in serious problem. And I think they could also, many of them, realize that actually, even if rich people do pay tax, personal income tax, even if more companies do pay personal income tax, even if we put up excises on uh, luxury goods, you know, the top 20% in Africa, and they're still going to be fine. We're not talking of making people poor here, um, but we're talking of, you know, paying enough um, to government that they have a slightly more secure and less politically fractured environment in which to live and to make more money in future. Thanks. Um, so we, we have more and more questions here. Uh, we have a number of questions about high net worth individuals, and maybe I will start by just picking one so we can, we can get onto some of these questions. This is a question from Lucky Star Miandazi, who says, uh, thank you for the presentation. The number of high net worth individuals is not huge in the two country examples used, R Rwanda and Uganda. That means that even taxing them will not increase revenue substantially. How then do Sub-Saharan African countries bring in more people into the taxing bracket if it's a bad idea to also tax the informal sector? Um, does Millie want to take that first? Yes, I'll take it first. Um, the number of high net worth individuals may not be big in these countries, 
but you find that uh, for, for a number of uh, developing economies, 80% uh, of the revenue comes from 20% of, of the, the, the taxpayers. And like I shared, almost half of ours are in, in the small and medium. So even if you tackled about 10 or 15 high net worth individuals, you would have a significant increase in the revenue. They would cover about uh, 200,000 of the small ones, and you'd be able to strike a balance like Mick shared, is that you, you do not press the small ones, but you, you, it, it's more aligned to the, the, the income inequalities in our respective economies. You'll find there are those who are very high, and then there are those who are very low in, in the income bracket. So yes, they may not be many, but tackling them will bring an impact, change of behavior, and will be able. To, and once the, 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 the lower ones see that the, the ones earning a lot are paying, it's an automatic change of behavior, and everyone will be tax compliant. I just add there, it, you're absolutely right. I mean, the individuals are small and, you know, we put the figures there because they signal a problem, but I mean, they signal a much bigger problem. And I think if we're looking for more revenues, again, it's going to vary from country to country according to the situation. But most countries could quite quickly, within a couple of months, either increase existing excise taxes on certain luxury goods, uh, consumed mainly by rich people, or they could introduce them from afresh. And that would make a significant difference. And in fact, let me just do a little advertisement for WIDA here. WIDA has just published a study that's been done, again in Uganda. Uganda has a lot of research um, on excise taxes. And it shows very clearly that on balance, excise taxes in Uganda, which are quite significant, do fall more on rich people than on poor people. But they also show that um, the excise tax on locally brewed gin falls mainly on poor people, whereas the excise tax on um, fuel fall, falls mainly on rich people. So it's not difficult. Once you know broadly the pattern of expenditure of different groups of households, it's quite easy to go through and say, well, excise taxes on this, they will mainly be paid by the rich and those will be paid by the poor. So it's not hard to design an excise tax regime that would actually generate more revenue. But that's one wealth taxes and we can start by sensible levels of taxes on housing and other urban buildings. I mean almost completely untaxed in Africa so that's significant. Just making more effort to make sure that more people actually who are likely to be wealthy uh, submit personal income tax returns and that these get to some degree audited. This will take us well beyond that very small number of high net worth individuals to um, in many African countries, thousands of people who can pay significant amount of money and currently don't pay it. Um, Millie mentioned earlier in some African countries, a lot of uh, Income is generated by people who own properties in capital cities and rent it out, but manage not to pay um, uh, any tax on the rental income. Uh, Uganda has been tackling that, as some other countries have, but again, it's, an, uh, it's another source of revenue. So there are quite a few. Oh, and the, the biggest one, the biggest single one, is the un justified tax exemptions for investors. It's not unusual for people to calculate that the tax lost through uh, unjustified tax exemptions is somewhere in the order of 10 or 20 percent of existing tax revenue. In other words, if you can cut down those unjustified exemptions, um, which are not bringing in additional investment, you know, you can bump up your tax revenue by 10 percent in two years or some such figure. This is not this is not marginal. This is real money. Thanks. Um, I'm going to go to two questions from Nick Matheson, which I think follow on quite well from your, your comments just now. Um, so actually, it's a three part question, but I'll just read two of two of the parts. Um, first, on the granting of excessive exemptions, which specific exemptions would you prioritize to crack down on? 
And uh, secondly, which countries would you say have the political will to introduce higher property taxes in Sub-Saharan Africa? Millie, again? <laughs> I think you go first. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know, on any of these things, I don't know which countries have the political will. And one reason I don't know is because these issues of the gross underpayment of taxes by certain categories of wealthier people in Africa has barely been discussed so far. This has not been on the agenda. And, uh, you know, people like Millie and me and other people have been trying to do it. And I think we're fairly early at the stage there. And until you get a good public discussion of this, you don't have a real sense of whether this is going to be picked up and someone is going to say, yes, this is what we need to do. Um, there is an interesting case on property taxes that uh, let's hope it works, but the mayor of Freetown in Sierra Leone has just pushed through the city council a major revision of the property tax system that results in a very substantial increase in property taxes on wealthy people, and they just started collecting about two weeks ago. I don't know whether this is going to work, fingers crossed, but here is a smart politician who realized that, yes, there is something in this for me by introducing a fairer system that people perceive as fair and getting enough revenue to do interesting things. So that's on the property taxes on which exemptions. Again, we can't give a specific answer, but the exemptions which are given to investors, and there are an enormous range of different types of exemptions, have been examined again and again and again and again by economists and other tax specialists. And they always come up with the same answers that there are far too many of these and they're given in the wrong way and they're not sufficiently tied to real investment and real improvements in productivity coming in. And it would not be difficult for us to design a system that uh, resulted in a much closer connection between exemptions and you know real investment coming in from outside. I'm sorry, that is a very vague answer. Um, they say the, the professional consensus on this is very, very strong. It's just that the political incentives for governments to carry on giving indiscriminate exemptions to their friends or people who put money in the right bank accounts is um, rather strong also. Mm -hmm. Okay, Rachel, I come in. Um, yes, I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to approach this from the angle of visibility into what's happening, and uh, from what what Mick has shared, uh, you can see that for as long as the the economies, the tax administrators are not able to quantify that the exemptions that they are saying are excessive and not properly given and. Uh, 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 are not really impacting on revenues. Uh, in my in my view, exemptions is um, is a tool that governments use to either attract and uh, and and make um, attractive the, the environment. So as as professionals, when we get into there and try to put reason to it, it doesn't um, align very well with the political. Um, direction. So for me, I would rather than 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 go for these is because we've we've even recommended recommendations have come through that let's have um, exemptions that are sector wide so that you know that this sector has been exempted and and it is clear. But it is I think it is a tool that is used and I, I kind of shy away and allow the politicians to do to do their job because everyone is an expert in their own area. They are an expert in tax and they are an expert, experts in, in their uh, political arena. When we get to the, to the area of uh, political will to increase property tax again, and, and this speaks again very much to what Mick was saying, what are the plans, what are the visions, what are the analytics, how are you using the information technology that is available, the data and, and everything. In this area, if we are not able to quantify and, and make visible, like uh, I'll say for the case of Uganda, we've, we've had our president bring back the bills in line with, uh, with rental income tax because he believes 
that there is value there in rental income tax. Yes, most of the property owners, again, are the decision makers in our respective economies. But when you make visible the, 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 the quantum of money that these people are making, then it makes it difficult for, for them not to move with the, with, with the proposal to tax those areas. So that is one of the things that we've been working on of making it visible how much revenues are coming in and how much money is being used to, to remove these revenues. And that has um, convinced the political head that this is an area we need to go in. And once you have the political heads there, then you're ready. Then, then, then it will be very difficult for, for, for this not to go through. So I believe one of the things we need to do is to do more work in terms of analysis and put on table uh, the visibility into um, these um, the properties and uh, and maybe even the exemptions. But like I said, for exemptions, I think it's a tool and it will take because so much work, like Mick has said, has been done on this over in different countries with different teams. But I think the politicians um, use this as a tool and. Uh, we, we may not go very, very far in there, but we may go far on the other proposals that uh, Mick has shared in terms of planning, in terms of taking care of the poor, and in terms of looking for, for the rich and making visible what they are earning so that they are able to give their take to the respective governments. Thank you. Um, I think that's maybe a, a nice place to end. Unfortunately, I'm under strict, in, strict instructions to end on time. Um, there are a number of questions still here in the box, and I hope that our, um, our team here at WIDER can save them for us so we have them as well. But I'd like to just thank Mick and Millie for really um, interesting and thought-provoking presentations um, as we think about how COVID-19 is changing development in the area of taxation, um, thinking about threats and opportunities in particular. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you very much.